go live. <clears throat> Got to start the. Uh, we're going to be ready in a few minutes. A uh, uh, little scenario on the YouTube. So we are now streaming on YouTube, saying that we're going to be ready soon. Really, really, we will. Ooh, I wonder if I got it there. Is there a VP that would like to volunteer for minutes? Um, well, see, that doesn't work, Joy. You're supposed to look like you never really heard that at all. Because okay. we could take a look to the side of saying yes. <laughs> Okay, here's the quote as a like beginning Monday. We wanted to give others opportunities to volunteer too. Exactly, yeah. So beginning Monday, fully vaccinated. I anybody jumping on it. Beginning Monday, fully vaccinated students, faculty, and staff who self-report their vaccine information to the university will no longer be required to wear a mask or socially distance indoors or outdoors for most area of our campuses. Um, came recommendation, blah, 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 blah. Um, they continue to require face coverings regardless of vaccination status in classrooms, on campus transportation, with participants in human research and in healthcare areas where patients may be present. Um, that's pretty much it. They'll give you prizes if you register, things like that. So, But those two paragraphs were uh, indicative of what's going on. So it sounds like Monday they will be opening yeah. up some of that stuff. Obviously, uh, you know, classrooms. I'm not sure what the observatory, how that qualifies. As well, a, the Natural History Museum is opening next week. Limited capacity, masks are required. The observatory, well, the uh, planetarium is closed. Right. But I'm, th I'm thinking of our McMath building, what they would say about that. And yeah. maybe that's something that we just got to bring up with somebody. Say, hey, what do you count oh, well, this as? I'll email Shannon Murphy and see what her what her take is on it. Yeah, is that because that's the one I'd have to schedule the room with anyway. Yeah. So is that we'll the, see what she says? Is that technically the astronomy department's uh, uh, property then? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, so astronomy sorry. department. Astronomy Department LSNA in particular. Well, right. if you're talking about, okay, Angel Hall, yes, the observatory. No, I, I'm talking about McMath at Peach Mountain. Okay, McMath at Peach oh. Mountain comes under College of Engineering, yeah. SEAS. Okay. And they have to look at their agreement, what they're doing out there. Uh, which we're going to discuss. I have some information that might help, but uh, nothing that is officially or confirming it. Okay. Right. It's seven thirty, so we uh, opened up our Zoom meeting to the stream. Okay. And looks like we got eighteen participants so far. Where is everybody? I will predict by the time we get to 735, that will be 25. We'll see. Anybody, anybody taking bets? <laughs> I haven't heard back from this mysterious Chuck person. Uh, so. um, I mean, Charles, if what you say is true, I would definitely ask you <laughs> to predict the stocks. <laughs> Well, Charlie's been no, at this presidency kidding. thing for a while, yeah. so. Yeah, Ani, I'm going to say between now and uh, about 30 Monday in stocks. Um, your voice broke. Yeah, you broke up, Don. We still want to hear the smart aleck comment. Well, the smart aleck comment was, I predict the stocks will not change between tonight and Monday morning at 9.30. So you don't have to read about it over the weekend. Depends. Are you talking about Dow futures or Dow industrials? Doesn't matter. The portfolio doesn't <laughs> move till 9.30. <laughs> Dow futures do matter. <laughs> they do trade over the weekend. Yes, they do. After market and pre market. And your other countries that have markets open trade. There you go. On the futures. That's the future. I'm so glad I'm not in the 
Mark. <laughs> it makes a couple of us, Doug. Well, that's, uh, the only thing I care about is Alibor, and that's why you know my I, I get some crumbs off the gazillions that are there, that are out there. That can that can change momentarily. I, so I've never <laughs> I've never liked I've never liked legal gambling. Uh, <laughs> well, they say it's not gambling if you know what you're doing. Yeah, us, pe- us peons don't know what we're doing, so it's. <laughs> I'm not going to bother. I don't have to bother. I'm all set for it. We got three minutes to get those last three, Charlie. Your last two. Isn't that called inside Actually, last, last two. We're last tough. two, yeah. Wow. That knowledge thing, isn't that uh, called insider trading? Well, yeah, that's, that's what I call uh, cheating. <laughs> That's why I won't play their game. <laughs> you know, it's just like you know uh, accounting principles. Uh, you know, it it's all depends on the definition, where your boundary is for inside and outside. Yeah, I, I, can you do insider trading if you run a, a company that makes play models? Hmm. No, that's all exterior. <laughs> That would, oh, have to, that would have to be superficial training. If it's superficial, I think I could do that. <laughs> well, if your retirement's through the university, you're in the market. Mm. Well, we yeah. might get to 25, but now I'm thinking we won't do it by 735. <laughs> Oh, you know. We're holding know. at 23, so. Oh. I guess speaker. I said second guest speaker. Oh, another Look one. Look at okay. how much that <laughs> baby has grown. Really? I still remember why. Like, almost as big as the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here she comes. Here he comes. So, oh, Aoni. Will your child be giving the talk in your place? <coughs> oh, he's running after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and actually, I think we are close enough to 735. So, with that, I would like to call us to order. Uh, do you want to wait for Ani to come back? Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, I figured he'd be right. Nah, back. we don't need it. <laughs> we saw him orbiting around or the sun there. So, anyway. Sorry, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, oh, no problem. That kid's really grown, on I me. Mean, what are you feeding that, that boy? Food. No. Just yeah, food. Yes, a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, Lots of driving food. us crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I'm Charlie Nielsen, <sighs> president of the University of Older Astronomers. Uh, we have several other officers present. We'll hear from some of them after our speaker tonight. Uh, this is our June meeting. Uh, once again, you notice we're doing it via Zoom, but we're hoping that that's going to get modified and we'll be able to do some live things pretty soon. So, uh, and just a reminder, as always, we also are recording on YouTube. So, with that, our uh, speaker tonight is actually one of our own, Ani Hafid. And one moment here. There we go. Uh, Ani is an amateur astrophotographer and a low-brow member, as we know. He got himself involved with astrophotography since 2015 to share with his family and friends the unseen beauty of deep space objects, and he is still fascinated with the majesty and challenge of this hobby. What we didn't know about our, uh, Ani is that he also loves archery, diving, and he's looking very much forward to seeing everyone in the star party, hopefully soon. That we would have guessed. So with that, you have the stage, Johnny. Okay, hi everyone. Um, um, I'm the speaker today. Um, in very short notice, I managed to get you guys a presenter presentation about solar imaging and processing which I hope it's going to make sense. Um, do let me know if I'm too fast 
or if I'm if all the information are too complicated at the end of the presentation, I'll be more than happy to explain it and make it even simpler. So let me start the share here. Share screen. Yeah. Everyone sees. Can you can you can you see the screen? Yep, we yep. see it good. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, do follow me on Facebook or Instagram if you have any question. I do share my um, images over there um, with all the comments or you know everything that I learn. Um, I just put it in there for you know future references. Um, today's uh, presentation is about solar imaging and processing. Um, I will be talking about um, equipment, basically normal cameras and um, dedicated telescopes, solar telescopes. Um, I will talk about how to capture those images and techniques about capturing them. And then um, at the end, I'll uh, talk briefly about image processing. I'm not going to go deep into it. I will include screenshots of how I do my images. And um, as they say, um, a picture, um, you know, uh, a picture explains a thousand words. So um, first, first, first thing first, solar imaging and night photography, a huge difference. Um, um, normally with night photography is we like to find a dark spot, we stay all night, we don't sleep, we get bitten by bugs, stuff like that. Solar imaging is way much easier. It's available every day as long as it's not cloudy. You can do it from anywhere, doesn't have to be a dark side. Um, it's um, the, imaging the sun is not like imaging s deep sky objects or planets or the moon or anything else. The moon is going to be the moon from now till God knows when. Galaxies, uh, deep sky objects are still going to be the same object. Solar imaging, on the other hand, what you image now, you won't see it tomorrow or even next two hours. It's always changing. That's the fun part about the sun, our sun. Um, so that kind of makes it more interesting and challenging. Um, where's that? Yeah, so if you don't have a dedicated solar telescope, mainly if you have just a camera with a zoom lens, um, you can definitely do um, sun, sun disks you know, to capture the sun, sunspots, you can do um, solar eclipse, um, the one that we had just a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can do ISS solar transits. That's all can be done with just a normal camera and a zoom lens. You don't technically need a, more than that. Um, here's examples of the um, images. Um, that's th this one I, I took with... Um, my normal camera, Olympus EM5, with a zoom lens at, at 300 mil and a solar filter. Everyone speak, say, what is a solar for, filter? It's technically a dim filter. And it, it's a, uh, according to this, it's like a, 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 a 100,000 ND. That's dim. It, it's, it's more like a welding um, helmet. You only see like a, just a, very tiny bit of that image or dims it very much that you, you screw this on top of your lens and then you point it at the sun and that's technically what you get with just one click um, other spa other examples are solar eclipse this one is from 2017 the eclipse that we saw here in michigan um, and again, that was done with the same camera, just one click every um, every 30 seconds or every 20 seconds, and then just stacked together and created this video. That's one thing you can do with normal camera. Um, the, there you go. The other thing you can do is solar transit or ISS transit, I'm sorry. Um, 
just basically predict where the when the ISS when and where the ISS is gonna um, pass in front of the sun. And um, you know, it, it, with this one, you'll need a, to capture a video, not a not not just like click, not not just a click, uh, a, a, a fast rate video that will capture the whole thing across the sun, and then you can just stack all the frames that where the ISS um, uh, passed in front of it and, you know, create this picture. That wasn't me. I, I don't have a ISS transit in front of the sun. So I got that from, from Google, someone. So um, I'll just, uh, for the credit. Uh, now with um, solar dedicated scope, it's a totally different beast. Um, you can still capture the sun disk, you can still capture um, sunspots, um, but way more details. There are tons of structure and um, texture within the sun. You can capture prominences, you can capture um, the sunspots, you can see all the flares, uh, you know, escaping from the sunspots. Um, both way, you know, like even promise or sunspots or even the full disk, you can do time lapses. Um, and um, examples to that, for example, this sunspot, it's just a, the, the whole disk with a normal camera, it was just like um, a, 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 um, an orange's, orange disk. It was okay, fine. But with a solar scope, you can get all the texture on the sun. It's just next level amazing. It, 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 it's a next level amazement. Um, so with this one, you, you see all the texture here, you see all the flares, you see the sunspot here. Um, so that's one thing. You can zoom in and you can get the prominence as well, um, as well as the, the texture on the sun. You know, the, the, exactly the prominence. The uh, sunspot, uh, you can get the sunspot as well with all the flares um, escaping from it. That's also the, uh, possible with the dedicated solar scope. Um, time lapse, which, uh, which is my, my favorite, is when you capture one image after the other or one video after the other um, with like certain space or certain time in between, 30 seconds, for example, and then you put everything together in a um, time lapse with you, like so. So what you're looking here is um, a time lapse that was captured for two hours, but then uh, played so fast that you can see all the changes um, in a very, you know, you can see all the changes super fast. Um, one thing about solar imaging is, which, you know, please guys, don't look at the sun. <laughs> it can ruin your eyes. Um, if you're planning to go outside and uh, enjoy a solar imaging, make sure you have some sunscreen, uh, some creams, sun cream, some hat, some, you know, um, somewhere shady to protect yourself. Wear sunglasses in case of, you know, if it's snow, if there's a snow on the ground, because it can blind you. Um, uh, because you're under the sun, you might get dehydrated. So get some drinks, get some food. Um, if you're planning to do um, ISS transit imaging, where you can't just do it from, I mean, you, you might be able to do it from home if you're lucky, but if you're planning to drive somewhere to um, see where the transit is going to be, you know, just plan your day, plan your you plan if you need a hotel, um, you, you know, um, make sure you, you get there by time in, in time for the transit. So, you know, just a few, few recommendation if you're planning to do solar imaging. Um, Unfortunately, with solar imaging, the only thing that, I mean, a couple of things, but one of the things are the, the clouds. If it's cloudy, you can't image the sun. So one, some of the, there are um, some 
applications and websites that can predict your um, weather. So um, I just included uh, an app um, both in on Android and um, Apple um, cell phones, which which is called Astro Astrospheric. Um, this can predict your weather in case if you're planning to do some solar imaging or you know drive drive somewhere for for solar imaging. Um, for um, dedicated solar scope, um, it's nice to know what's on the sun. You know what's happening on the sun. Um, there is a website that will show you what's the hydrogen activity, hydrogen alpha activity on the sun. Um, it's very useful if you're planning to do, um, you know, special, if, if you if you basically looking for a prominence, is there any, it's clear sky, is there any prominence? Does it okay. worth my time and effort um, to image the sun? That's one thing you can find out how. Um, for ISS Transit, um, there is the transitfinder.com that technically you technically punch in your location and it will tell you if there is any ISS transit in front of the sun where you live or how long, how far you have to travel to get that, uh, to get the transit, you know, to see the transit and, you know, altitude, what time, when does it start, when does it end, the whole thing. It's on, it's on the website. Um, Equipment wise, uh, a so the reason I mentioned that is not like deep sky, you know, um, deep sky imaging. You need like a special camera or a dedicated camera, modified camera, stuff like that. No, you just need a camera. Any camera will do so. Preferably a camera that, that can do a video. That that's a plus. Um, lens. You need a zoom lens. The at least 600 mil or 500 mil at least so to cover the whole sun. Um, remote shutter is preferable so you don't have to touch your camera. Um, solar filter is a must. Don't point your camera to the sun. It will melt the sensor easy in seconds. Um, tripod is, a, is also a must because you're zooming into the sun and um, you can't hold that with your hand. It's, uh, you know, it's not like a wide field photography that you can take with your hand, it, you're zoomed in. So you need something steady or stable to image the sun. Lots of batteries, lots of storage, at least 32 gig, um, in case if you're planning to do um, video capturing. Um, Star tracker is preferable again because you're zoomed in. It's I'm not saying you can't, but think of it this way: when you when the sun is in the field of view without a tracker, you're gonna have to fix you know fix your aiming every I would say every second or every two seconds. Um, the Earth rotates so fast that the sun will disappear out of your field of view in seconds. So a tracker is preferable. Um, to do, um, you know, to do solar imaging. Guide scope or, you know, um, somewhere to, to point your telescope or your camera um, to the sun. Don't aim your, don't put your telescope, you know, don't aim your telescope on the sun. You're technically looking at the sun. There are different ways to do so. E the easiest way is just get two cardboards, put a hole on, on one end, and just pay, aim it at the sun. The sun will pierce that hole and will put a shadow on the other side. And that's when you know you're you're roughly aiming at the sun. That's another way is to buy something like the image here. Same thing, there is a hole here and there is a, um, like a, um, uh, how to put it? Like an aiming aiming device here. When the, when the sun hit that yellow white spot, you're technically um, aligned with the sun. So yeah, don't look at the sun, please do. Please don't guys. Um, laptop is optional. It gives you more control, but it, you know, you don't need it if, you, if you're planning to use a DSLR, for example. Um, 
there are two, you know, like like I just, like I just mentioned, you can use a normal camera, preferably with um, that can capture an AVI video, or you can do an aster, a dedicated aster camera, aster photography camera, mono color, both will do. Um, you will need a computer though. Um, solar scopes, dedicated solar scope. There are so many brands. Technically, the whole idea of the solar scope is um, it it blocks everything except a, a a tiny bit of the wavelength. They call it angstrom. So they it only passes point according to this 0.7 angstrom at um, 656.28 nanometer. That's super tiny. And um, even with that, you can, there are certain mechanisms within each solar scope that shift that angstrom to get that perfect contrast or you know perfect um, brightness um, that you like. And some, some of them are done electronically, like the, uh, what is that? Like the Daystar. Some are done uh, mechanically, like the uh, Coronado, yeah, you know, like the PST or the Lunt telescope. Um, Lunt is, uses the pressure, pressure uses pressure to shift that angstrom. Um, PST uses like tilt mechanism to do so. Um, anyway, each one has a different way to image the sun and shift that angstrom. Um, within that wavelength, uh, each one is, uh, they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> so, um, but the images that you get out of it is just next level imaging. Um, like I said, tracker is preferable because you're zoomed in. Um, you don't, uh, like, I said, like I mentioned, you don't want to modify your, you know, modify your aiming every second. Um, especially if you're like waiting for an I, for ISS, you have other things to, to deal with, you know, like when it's going to pass or am I on time? You don't want to go waste your time every second. Oh, I'm, I'm not in the middle. Oh, I'm not in the middle. I'm not in the middle. Tracker is definitely preferable. And it's, it's a must if you're planning to do time lapses. It's just time saving. That's my setup. The, um, this one is my setup previously. This is just a normal camera with a zoom lens. I had this DIY <laughs> shade to cover the uh, the camera from the side, you know, so it won't heat up. And in front of the camera, I'm sorry, in front of the lens, I have a, um, a, a solar filter screw in. This is my dedicated solar scope. Um, pretty much everyone saw it um, last last year from the uh, astronomy at the beach, and um, it, it, it's a, it, it's connected to a dedicated solar uh, uh, dedicated astro camera, and everything is connected inside. I don't have to go outside and fiddle with it. Um, that's just a, that's another uh, guide. Uh, I'm sorry, that's another tracker that you can get. Um, uh, Adrian, uh, probably, I believe Adrian still has something like that, and he just loves it. It works like a charm when he shoots the moon, or even when he did the solar eclipse a um, um, few weeks ago. It works like a charm. All, all I'm trying to say is, as long as anything that keeps the camera close to the sun, or keep the sun in the middle of the uh, field of view, should work. My name is Adrian Bradley, and I approve that message. <laughs> okay, so um, with solar imaging, you, you don't. It's more not. It's it's not as complicated as the deep sky optics. Um, where those who are familiar with deep sky imaging, you need bias frame, dark frames, um, certain amount of subs, it might take forever to capture the darks, etc, etc, etc. With solar imaging, all you have to do is just click. The sun is so bright, you don't have to do long exposure. You just like, a single click should do. If you need more details within the image, a video is preferable. 
Um, flats are definitely required. I mean, might be required if, if your sensor is super dirty. Yes, flats can be captured as well and applied. And then, um, you know, uh, later we'll discuss the calibration and stacking. Camera settings, um, uh, again, you're not doing long exposure, so um, anything between, um, you know, within 50 millisecond exposure, that's more than enough. Um, ISO 100 to 800 depends on what, the whole thing is related to the frame rate. If, again, if you're capturing a video, the faster the frame rate, the you're technically beating the um, the scene. So you play with your ISO and your exposure to get the fastest frame rate. Um, as I'm going to show you examples um, um, of the uh, solar capturing. Um, F-stop, again, depends on the frame rate. Um, you don't have to do like F2 or F4. That's way overkill. Um, F8 and above is, is normal. Uh, if you're planning to do once, you know, one image to file or raw image, or, or if you're planning to do a video, um, either AVI or SER format, reason B is they're not compressed. You're going to need them later on to when with the image calibration and stacking. But the whole idea is for the camera settings, whether it's a dedicated Astro camera or a normal camera, in case if you're doing a um, single image or a video, is your frame rate. You need fast frame rate to beat the scene. Uh, I probably just talk about that. Um, you can do one image or you can do um, a video of thousands of images. Uh, again, the reason we do that is because, um, even with the sun, you get like the um, seeing effect. Uh, it's like looking through, um, it's, like, it's like looking through the um, candle. The whole thing will shift. And again, I'll, I'll have examples later on to show you guys. Uh, so capturing multiple um, frame, you know, video with a lot of frames, you're technically going to capture that perfect picture out of those thousand frames. Um, and uh, you get, or you're only going to stack those good pictures together to get that perfect image. Um, the, um, as of now, there are two softwares that I, you know, um, that I use to capture the, uh, the, the sun. Fire capture, which is totally free, highly recommended. There is sharp cap. It's still free limit li with limitations, but um, both of them will do just fine with solar imaging. Um, this is an example of just one image of the um, solar eclipse back in 2017. Um, the software came with the camera and um, you know, I have a remote shutter with me. I just capture one image every two, two, five or 10 seconds. And that's how you saw that video in the beginning of the solar eclipse. Um, the, oh, this is with a dedicated solar scope. Uh, it's the, the image here is, a, it's a, it, this is just a one frame out of the thousand, 2000 frame video. And this is a stack, a 10% stack of those 2,000 frames, meaning um, I'm stacking 200 um, images out of those 2,000 frames um, together, the best ones. You can definitely see a difference. I don't know, if, I don't know about you guys, but like the, the, pro, the, the flare here or the sunspot here, here is way much sharper. You get much cleaner image. You got, this image is like, you got dots everywhere where here it's smooth and uh, perfect. And the reason I said that you need a video, for example, oops, see how much the sun uh, solar imaging wobbles. That's, that's normal. That's perfectly normal. 
And um, the reason he captured too many video, a video with too many frames, 200 out of those 2,000 frames are going to look perfect. And that's what the software is going to stack. So again, that's the reason why you capture a video. Same thing here. This is the stack. Unstable. Internet connection is unstable. Uh, hold on, guys. And um, I think your connection just went back to being a little more stable. So there. See how much. This is how much the. Uh, uh, solar imaging yeah, capture when, when you do um, uh, planetary image. The Sarah player is having it's a the scene. It's, it's something that we can't escape. Um, that's why we do high frame in uh, somehow. I hope I make sense. I don't know. Um, that's a very good example of bad seeing. This is a stack of, this is a 15% stack out of 2000 frame. Um, it looks good. It looks decent. This is just one image. If in, in case, if I just need one click, see how bad it looks. And it even looks bad when I run the video. You know, the, the 2000 video, how wobbly this video is. So that's why that's what that's what seeing is. So if you're lucky, that's technically called lucky shot. You're taking tons of images and you're gonna stack only the good ones. You're not doing that, the soluble. I think flat frame is exactly the same as the your light frame. You're taking same field of view, same spot. You're just going out of focus. The whole idea of the flats is to capture those uh, dirt spots or um, hair in the middle or you know uneven illumination or so, so stuff like that. Um, it's again the easiest way. Some people put like a, a plastic bag in front of it. Some people do like a T-shirt. I don't know. With solar imaging, none of them work. Easiest way is just go out of focus. And um, here's an example. So this is a raw video. Um, and uh, pay attention to this dot here. When I go out of focus, the dot is still there. That's on the sensor. Here, it's probably on within the tube, something uneven or a dot or dirt or whatever. You can definitely see it with the um, when you go out of focus. And what the software will do, well, I'll, I'll show you now. The next frame will show. Next slide will show you how um, the, the, the software will track this image from this flat and get you a clean image. See the dot here? It disappeared over here. That's technically what the software will do. Um, uh, I already spoke about that. So um, again, the reason we you capture a video so that he can be the seeing the, uh, the, the the software will technically align everything and stack the the best five to twenty five percent of your images. Um, flats will be that, uh, subtracted from the light frames so that any dust dust spot on within your light frame will be removed. And um, again, as of now, the best software that I stack and calibrate with is called Auto Stacker. It's it's free and highly recommended. Uh, this is how you create your master flat. You um, you run the software. You open that out of focus image. Then you go um, to image calibration, click on um, uh, create master flat or master frame. That's going to save it as a TIFF file. And then you um, and then you load it back into the software through load master, master flat. Later, you load all your images or just one image. I'm, I'm talking not image. Yeah, image or video, both of them. You just load it into the software and it will automatically 
um, subtract that flat uh, passive flat from your from your light frame. The way auto sacker does work um, with your light frames is um, again after you load that uh, massive flat, you open all your frames. Technically, you can either do one video if you capture just one video, or if you capture multiple video. Again, in case if you're doing time lapse, you can load all the videos together. Um, choose whether it's a planet or a service. So technically, this works also with planets and the moon. Um, analyze it. One after you analyze it, you'll get that graph here. That technically, how good are your images? Um, anything above fifty percent is good, but um, I usually do twenty five percent and below. Uh, you don't need a lot of frames to, um, you just need the best frames to be stacked. So in, in, in my case, I only choose 10% of those um, 2000 frames. And um, you just, um, you know, if you want to multiply it by two or just without any sampling, and then you stack it. That's going to end up creating a, a one file um, with the you know the stacked file of those ten percent frames, um, image processing. After you get that frame, you can either uh, keep it as it is if it's a good frame, or you can do some sharpening and adding color to it. Um, It's from now on. It's technically self preferences. It's 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 whatever you your 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 eyes is pleased with. Um, sharpening can be done with multiple softwares. There is the IMPG IMPPG free software. Photoshop, Pixinsight, not free software. You can add colors later on in case if if it's a mono camera or even if it's a color camera, it's it's up to you if you if you want to change the color. Um, yeah, we don't you don't have to do it with color camera. Well, with a mono camera, you can add colors um, using Photoshop, Pixinsight, any editing so editing software. Um, time lapse, you can do. Um, you have to align the the image. And um, I'll show you an example why. Um, when you capture multiple videos with 30 seconds in between, you're not, everything will shift, unless if you have a very expensive equipment that guides on the sun. Um, most of us don't. And uh, once you stack everything and align everything, then you can create a video that, you know, looks like a, a beautiful time lapse, steady, stable time lapse. Sharpening, for example, that IMPVG software, that's an example um, of what it can do. Uh, you just load the image and then play with its, with its settings. You play with the, uh, with the deconvolutions, you play with the um, unsharp mask, you play with the um, curves here, and that's technically the result. Again, you can do that with planets and the moon as well. So it gives you like a preview before and after. If you like that, you can apply it to the rest of the image. Same goes with time lapses. And because you got multiple images, um, you, can, you can do patch processing. You know, just, you don't have to do one image at a time. You can load all the images together. If you like the process, or if you like the sharpening on just one, it will apply it to all the images. That, that time saver. Um, adding color, so the image, the previous image here, it's all in what, black and white, it's monochrome. If you add, um, if you change it to color, you can do it in Photoshop. And again, any editing software will do. Um, basically, just open, open your RGB channel, red, green, blue channel, and change the uh, midtone, um, like, sh like, like shown here in the, in, in the slide. That will change the monochrome to, to, to red, to, you know, what you see here. Super easy. Um, I already explained about time lapses. Time lapses um, are, um, so whatever we do with just one image, it's, um, we do everything in sequence. 
mainly we capture one frame and put an interval or delay in between. And then we do so for the next two hours or three hours. And then the final frames, we just put them together and run them as a 20 frame per second video. Um, and that will technically, it will show all the activities that he captured in, for example, in one hour in three seconds. You know, I put an example over here, um, simple math. Uh, you will, again, um, you will need to do what you just saw about the sharpening and the calibration and the alignment, everything. You're going to have to do it for every image. And the nice thing with those softwares that I showed is you can do them in a patch process. You don't have to waste your time on every image. It, it, it does it all. Uh, an example, um, oh yeah, for time lapse, again, when I mentioned that you have to align all the frames together, you don't, we don't have, pro for example, you have a simple guide, guide uh, the tracker. And you don't have any guide scope with that. I mean, solar guide scope, which is very, super expensive. You don't have any way to keep the sun in the middle. It's always shifting. If you stack your images without aligning it, it's going to look like that. It's just, it's not pleasant. It's not, there's nothing fancy about that. Um, that's normal. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of software that can do the alignment or, uh, you know, the stabilization. Uh, PIPP is one of them. Uh, AutoStacker also can do that. Um, IMPPG also can do that. You know, you got tons of options to do so. Um, here's an example from PIPP. You just load all your images that you captured. And within the processing options, you can apply service feature stabilization, stabilization crop it, and it, it goes like it, the, the blue one is the cropping, and the red one is where you need that feature stabilized. If after you run that, it, 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 the, the software will create a video for you or individual files, it's up to you. And uh, the final frame or the final video will look like that. It technically stabilized the video for you according to the feature that you um, told the software. And after the sharpening and adding the color, it should look like that. I think the uh, when the SER file viewer goes backwards, then it's when your computer stops doing the networking stuff. Oh, okay. Thanks for that. So uh, I don't have any SCR player running. No. Um. So far, so good. Um. Again, um, the, um, if you'd like to try any of those softwares, here's a link that you can download it. Um, again, I didn't go deep into image processing because each one of them, if you, if you search YouTube or Google, you'll get tons of educational videos that will tell you how to do it. And um, again, if you need any help, just let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy to help. Um, that's, um, that the, these links are for the capturing softwares as well as the uh, image processing softwares. And, um, here are some of the examples that I captured for the past year, years actually. Um, this one I call, um, a sun heart. That was just by mistake. I captured it and it's a time lapse and, uh, it shows a heart shape. And that's with the dedicated solar scope. Um, technically captured the prominence um, with 30 second exposure, I mean, um, 30 second interval in between. 
And um, again, by chance, I guess I got that heart shape and within the prominence. Um, let me just fast forward. There you go. I don't know if you can see the heart shape. It was just epic. Um, I call this the um, sneezing sun. Um, watch this guy. Achoo! Again, by chance, I was just like, oh, that's a beautiful promise. Let me just do a time lapse on it. And um, out of the blue, that, that flare just um, escaped. It was just epic. Um, the, um, you can also do just one video, um, like that with the, with the, with the prominence and the sun, um, uh, the sun surface. And, um, nice thing about prominences is, is few people know about that is it can swallow, um, 10 to 20 earth sized planet. That's how big this thing is. Um, I did put a, a, I did scale earth next to it. So just to give you an idea how big that prominence is. Um, that's another example um, of a time lapse. And um, this is only two hour time lapse, capture the sun for two hours, but it does capture the sun's rotation. You can definitely recognize it um, in this video. There is a, the whole thing rotate just tiny bit. That's just for two hours. It's just, it's just beautiful. Like I said, my, my favorite spot, my favorite, uh, my favorite solar imaging is time lapse. It just tells you a lot of, a lot of what's happening. Um, I already showed you this again, this can be done with just a normal camera with a zoom lens. Um, it's the 2017 eclipse. Um, we just had an eclipse um, a couple of weeks ago, and you can definitely do that, uh, you know, capture that eclipse as well with a normal game. You know, uh, you can still do, do it with a normal camera. Um, the only difference with the, the, the eclipse that happened two weeks ago, it was just way close to the horizon that you, not, you don't need a solar, a solar filter. The, uh, the atmosphere technically dimmed the sun enough so you can capture it without any solar filter. It was just epic. Uh, that's another example of a prominence time lapse. Um, uh, you might ask, what is that dark background? I just dimmed that it dimmed the sun's um, surface, so it doesn't overwhelm the prominence. So the whole thing looks more um, uh, appealing to the eye. Uh, Ani, uh, for the uh, video, the time of the video that had the Earth uh, uh, in it as well. Uh, yes. Did it, did it, do you do something similar? Because I know it was like a very thin, uh, dark line uh, by, uh, just inside the edge of the sun. No, that's just, no. Not that one, but the, the one before that. Okay. Um, this one? Yeah. Uh, the one with the earth. Uh, yeah, that one. What about it? Yeah, see there's like a very thin dark line just inside the edge of the sun. Yeah, right there. No, that's normal. That's just, that's how the sun, that's how it came out. I didn't know, I didn't know it exists till I finished processing it. It's technically, I, I don't know exactly what that is, but I'm guessing it's the, um, you know, the sun's surface. That's, that's how it looks. I'm, I'm, I don't I, I can't explain it to be honest, but yeah, um, it is amazing. Okay, thanks. Um, Last and not least, that's uh, another time lapse um, that was way zoomed in, and um, and again, that's a, that's the beauty about solar imaging. Um, what you capture right now 
you won't see it in next in, in next two hours or next day. It's always changing, so it's never it's not a boring um, field of photography. It's always you always gonna get something new. Um, with that said, any questions? And um, again, sorry for the um, probably went too quick. But yeah, do let me know if you have any questions, please. I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer anything. So, uh, Ani, uh, when I've done a solar eclipse, uh, when I've tried to align them, the software, because it's the, the, side, the shape of the sun keeps changing, I've had trouble with alignment. How do you align yours to make a video? Hold on. There you go. P-I-P-P. Okay. It, it was able to recognize the shape even though the sun kept yes. changing shape? Yes, yes. Okay. It can. Um, it, uh, um, uh, hold on just a second. I, uh, there is an option here that you can tell the software um, align the planet, you know, the sun, uh, the, the, upper t the, the upper edge of the sun or the mm. left edge or the right edge. Ignore everything else. You exactly. can do that with the software. I don't know if it was PIPPG no. or IMPPG. No, you, got, IMP you got it in there. It's the uh, t uh, near the top of the menus, enable surface feature tracking. There you go. That's it's one of them. The, one of the and arrows again, is pointing there. You got tons of options. If IPP, I'm sorry, PIPP doesn't work, you don't, you know, for some reason, you got another free software, IMPPG. If IMPPG doesn't work, then you got AutoStacker. Both Auto of them. AutoStacker won't do it. I know that. I'm sorry, what? AutoStacker won't do that. I know that. It does. It will. It can. You can. Uh, with AutoStacker, Auto you, you, you put all your frames together mm -hmm. and then you just tell it, hey, I need those edges. I need you to align those edges to me. You, you know, when you put, uh, I can show you an example. Just give me a second. Auto Stacker uses uh, those uh, during the alignment uh, process, it uses a bunch of little squares. And if you set the number of squares fine enough, it will track the, uh, the surface of your edge. It works the same way in planetary as it does for solar. Uh, okay. That's probably a bad example, but you know, it's just an example. Okay. You see those sampling points? You can you can tell it, hey, I want you to ignore everything else except one, two, three, four, five. I need you to align my image according to those sample points. Right. Okay. I'll give that a try. There you go. So you just pick that the, the edge that is always visible. In the solar eclipse, you know, you click, you put those sample points on top, and the software will do the um, alignment for you. Okay. okay. Well, I've got a tip: if you're trying to use a regular telescope, the finder scope, and you don't want to burn your eye out finding the sun, I just drilled like a sixteenth inch diameter hole in the lens cap of my finder scope, and then put a piece of paper behind the eyepiece. It'll project the sun onto that paper, and when the image of the sun is centered in the shadow of the crosshairs, then you're pointing straight at the sun. Exactly. Same concept this guy does. Yeah. Um, Except this way, you don't need to buy an extra device. You just drill a tiny hole. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, each it works everywhere. Uh, it, yeah. it works. You can do multiple. Uh, there are multiple options to aim your telescope or camera to the sun. But um, unfortunately, I've see, I, I still see people pointing, using their eye to point their telescope to the sun. <laughs> That's why I mentioned it. Any other questions? For the tracking, is yes. there is uh, are you relying mostly on the mount? To do the tracking, or is there? Uh, I mean, there's a software packages that do that instead. I, I don't know. If your if your mount is properly aligned, yeah. Um, if your if your mount is properly aligned, they usually have like a solar rate 
but that assumes that you're you're no it's the same it doesn't it doesn't matter to be honest solar root okay <laughs> lunar lit rate or solar rate it's almost the same but yes i do use um, software tracking or guiding in this case um and i've only seen it in um, fire capture there is a plugin within fire capture that is called um auto guiding um, and what it does, it, it connects to your mount and um, you technically just choose a feature on the sun. And okay. every time that, is, for example, a sunspot, every time that sunspot shift to the left, right, up, down, fire capture tells the mount, hey, correct yourself. That sunspot is going left. Move yourself right. I think and, you know. I think you may have demonstrated that uh, in your last presentation, actually, showing I did. Uh, I did. the planetary stuff. I, That's worth I did. checking out. I did. But, um, but again, um, even again. with that, it's not perfectly, you know, perfectly, perfectly aligned. It, it, you're always going to get that shifting left and right. And that's why you need to, um, with a time lapse, for example, you still need to align all your frames together yep. using using those softwares that I mentioned. Okay, we'll look into Fire Capture for sure. Well, Fire Capture is the capturing software. Correct. Uh, it, 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 later on, with the image processing, it's is when it when those softwares come in handy um, to stack and align everything for you. Those those three. The re again, the reason I like them is because they're free. Any other questions for Ryan? Wow, can't believe we took it that easy on you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, well, I have a question for Ronnie. Could you use another lowbrow hat or t-shirt? A t-shirt would be fun. I got What's tons of, of large. Thank large. you. You got it. Okay. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. And thank you very much, Ani. Hey, my uh, pleasure. Just a matter of a fine presentation, but you had to do this on the rest time scale too. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank you. hope you guys liked it. It's uh, definitely. Hey, everybody um, stuck around for it. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> and that means it's, uh, that means it was good. Of course, just as you said that, Jeff, somebody dropped out. <laughs> well, you know, the presentation's yeah, over anyway. with. <laughs> yeah, but there you go. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll go ahead and move into officer reports. Uh, I have a few things to go over myself. Uh, we did recently manage to have an officer's meeting uh, via Zoom, of course. And uh, I will go over some of the things I mentioned. I think uh, Jack is going to add some stuff that he brought up. Uh, Doug Scoble also had some things, but he's not here tonight. He's going to actually email us his report. Um, and uh, I think Liz might have something to add on to uh, part of what I've got too. So anyway, uh, one of the things that we discussed was the Detroit Observatory. And that is because uh, one of our members, Gary Krenz, who actually was a low brow many years ago, uh, kind of a dropped out for a while, but has recently rejoined the club. Uh, he works for the Bentley Library and also is the manager of the Detroit Observatory and the construction that's going on there. So uh, he would like to, A, at some point when that is done, where he can have people and show what happened there, uh, which sounds like it will be probably this fall. Uh, he would like at a minimum to arrange a uh, time that we could go over there and he could give us a tour of the place. Or even better yet, uh, is actually have one of our meetings over there. Uh, I think that's kind of a better venue if we can pull it off because we can uh, more likely get more people there. Uh, and in addition to that, if that goes well and we like the idea, 
then uh, he has opened up the idea of us moving our meetings there on a regular basis. So first, I want to one second here, get back to my, there, so I can see everybody. So my question is, uh, and you can just sort of wave your hand to let me know, does moving, if this works out, to having our meetings at the Detroit Observatory, do you think that's a good idea? Yeah. Will they have enough space? There? Pardon me? Will they have enough space? I mean, yeah. 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 They've done some some definite add on. Well, Adrian's voting twice. So, yeah. uh, the main yeah, issue I don't think is parking. Yeah. Yes. And that is the whole thing. That was one of the things we discussed is uh, parking. Another one was handicap accessibility or even just accessibility for somebody that. Well, you know, like me, it's 67 years old and uphill is a little more uphill than it used to be. Uh, uh, but as it turns out, uh, Liz had uh, found something that kind of erased our concerns about that. So it really comes down to parking. And again, I think she's going to add on to that uh, with a discovery that she made later on. But this is something that, you know, is down the road. Uh, so we'll see how that develops. But I just thought I'd throw it out there and I suspected most people would think that was a really good idea. I mean, it does seem kind of cool to have an astronomy club meeting in a, inside an observatory. Uh, it's still on campus. Uh, a lot of nice things about it, really. I don't think they'd have any problem having all the technology we need as far as broadcasting those meetings. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. Again, uh, the parking's really gonna be the question, so. Can you get the point at the 12 inch? Pardon me? You get to play with the 12 inch? He didn't mention that one way or the other. Uh, so I guess I won't say one way or the other. I'm kind of guessing probably. But, uh, ah, but I'm glad you did mention that, Doug, because there is one thing that he would like to get from us if that's possible, and that is help with the 12 inch. Uh, they're always looking for people to operate the telescope, uh, probably even docents to work there. Uh, I know after they renovated the telescope, there was a period of time where uh, I think it was Patricia Whitesell, if I recall, uh, she uh, headed up that whole restoration project and did a really excellent job of managing that and getting it done. The downside was, is she also, after that, sort of controlled it with an iron fist in a sense, and she was not going to allow anybody to use that telescope. She didn't even want anybody touching it, and that included people at the U of M. Uh, unfortunately, she did pass away a few years ago. That's when the Bentley Library took over, and uh, uh, once they did, they thought that it was a shame to have that instrument sit there basically unused. And, just as a, a showpiece in a sense. So at that point is when the U of M astronomy department started to do some open houses up there. When they first started that, a number of uh, low grouse did actually go up there and check the place out. And I don't remember who it all was, but several of us actually got trained on operating the telescope. I don't know that any of them really continued on uh, and, you know, help them with, say, open houses. I do know for a long time, uh, Shannon and Joe Murphy uh, were doing a great deal of that. Uh, and, and possibly that's part of the thing is that they were the only ones and they would like to spread that around a little bit. But I guess I'm surmising there. So, uh, but that is something that Gary's going to hope that maybe he can uh, find some help with that amongst our club members. So, but anyway, we'll see how that uh, goes along and develop. So I think at the very minimum, we're going to have a meeting over there probably, and, and we'll just sort of take it from there. So uh, another item was, and this has to do with meetings, is uh, I just got word a few days ago that Rudy Lindner, who is our was our July speaker, uh, had something come up such that he's now going to be out of town and will not be able to be our speaker for July. So we thought, well, do we go looking for a replacement immediately? Uh, however, uh, another thing that was discussed at the officers meeting is an idea that Paul Wachalski 
actually brought up to me, and that is a resurrection of something that we did many years ago, and that was a swap meet. Uh, for a long, long time, our April meeting was really two things. It was officer elections and then a swap meet. We didn't even usually have a guest speaker. Uh, I would say the last few years we did the swap meet, I think we probably had a speaker also. But the swap meet was just an opportunity for any club members that had anything that they wanted to sell or possibly trade to bring that stuff into that meeting. And uh, everybody could take a look if there was anything they wanted to buy or trade something with somebody else for something. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it was really kind of fun. The thing is, though, is that it slowly started to kind of dwindle. You saw less and less stuff show up. A lot of the stuff that did were uh, more in the area of spare parts and things like that. It just wasn't as, oh, wow, kind of stuff as it was at one time. Perhaps that was because we did it every year uh, and people simply started running out of things. Uh, also, somebody mentioned in the meeting that since that time, uh, the Ford Club has had that big event they have in, uh, I believe that's in the spring, uh, where they have a swap meet and, you know, maybe that kind of put a dent in it too. Uh, but it was kind of fun. Uh, another thing, and this maybe didn't uh, kill any interest in it necessarily, but something I thought was perhaps a little bit of an issue, and if we do it again, I would like to ask people not to do, and that is people would bring stuff in. They'd be at the meeting early before we got started, and most of the good negotiating and purchases happened before we ever started the meeting. So... The problem was that kind of sucked the wind out of it when we got to the part to actually officially do the swap meet because a lot of it was already over. <laughs> but uh, that's just something we'll have to think about if we want to try to like say we can't do that until after uh, you know a certain designated time, something we'd have to think about. Uh, I guess the first thing before I lay out the rest of my thought here is, again, if I can just kind of get a show of hands, do you think trying another swap meet would be a good idea. Well, there is the art fair that week. Oh. Where, where would we be meeting? Well, I'll kind of get to that. As far as the swap meet, uh, we could have it as part of a meeting, but then we'd have to have, a, well, theoretically a live meeting, but I did think of some ideas that maybe we wouldn't even have to be live. Uh, we could actually do it via Zoom. It's just that anybody that bought or traded anything would have to make some arrangement to actually make the exchange, uh, you know, outside of that meeting. But it's maybe possible. Uh, um, but what do you think? Is that something, I mean, would people have stuff to bring if we tried such a thing? I'm actually not seeing a great deal of interest. If so, wave your hand. No? I think we'll I will. Go ahead, Jack. Right. Okay. Yeah. The point I think we need to look at this is a lot of times you're doing this in-house together and a lot together. You're seeing the products and everything, what it is that you're actually buying. If you're going to do it on as a Zoom meeting, I, I don't know how many people would feel that good with it. You know, you when you start looking at parts sometimes you want to measure stuff see how it is how it fits a telescope or, or if other things about it and that and uh when you're looking at it at a zoom it's just you know, like i'm gonna hold this up here go look at it you know well that that may not be that interesting or may not give you enough information that you want that's why i'm a little yeah. light on it I'm, I'm looking at that issue there that is a good point jack or, you know, like a, a eyepiece, it'd be kind of hard to tell the real condition of an eyepiece That's very holding true. it up to a camera, for example. So, yes. Uh, but I, I was surprised. I thought I'd see a lot of hands go up in interest, and I really didn't. So, maybe what I'll do is send an email about this to the club membership since we'll hit the wider audience and just kind of get an idea is there enough interest to really consider doing it? Based on what I see right now, I would say no. So, uh, 
But anyway, going on, uh, this sort of ties into an idea I had for our July meeting. And that was if we, if there was interest in a swap meet, then that could be part of that meeting. It would help make up for maybe not getting a speaker if that was to happen. Uh, concurrent with that is the possibility that we could actually have a live meeting in July. And that, of course, is definitely in the realm of just possibility at this point. Uh, as you might recall, normally we would also have that July meeting at EMU. Uh, I have not actually checked yet to see if our fair interferes with our meeting time, but I suspect that it does. Uh, so I plan to email Norb and just get a feel from him whether a live meeting would even be a possibility over at EMU. Uh, and if it was, then another advantage there is when we go there, Norb usually does a little bit of a planetarium show uh, or, you know, it just shows us some of the latest things that's going on. But that was something that we all enjoyed. And uh, again, kind of takes the pressure perhaps off of uh, coming up with a speaker. So I'll continue to work on this and post everybody and uh, we'll see if we can come up with. So uh, another item that we had discussed is, uh, as you might remember, we get award pins from the Night Sky Network on an annual basis it happens i forget sometime in the spring uh it's actually three award pins unless i do some stuff with them and request more because i think we can get maybe five i forget but uh we get these three by default and the intention is to award club members uh particularly for outreach things because that's what night sky network is really all about uh, so what happened is, I guess it would be almost three years now ago, I got the three pins in. They went into an area inside my briefcase and I sort of neglected to even notice they were there for a while. And then the next thing you know, COVID hit, so we couldn't meet anyway. And then right behind that, I got the next batch of pins. And then I got the next batch just this last time. So two of those times, we couldn't meet live anyway. So the net result is I've got three years worth of pins <laughs> or nine of them. So we had some discussion about who we thought those pins should go to. And as usual, we could think of more people than we have pins, but uh, but we did come up with it. Uh, again, it was mostly to do with outreach and we're kind of looking back over the last three years. So that first year it would be people that say were involved in open houses or other outreach things but since covid the biggest outreach thing we've really done is astronomy at the beach so as you'll see uh that was a uh, one of our focuses is who was involved in that uh in addition we had some people that uh have done little observing things for us uh, you can probably think who those are, and I'm going to name them in a minute, that were not even necessarily part of astronomy at the beach. Uh, we even considered things like, is the newsletter part of outreach? So uh, with that, what we came up with uh, for, again, any of these reasons or more than one of these reasons, we came up with Adrian Bradley, Ryan Autumn, John Wallbank, Jeff, Co 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 excuse me, Kapmanis, Doug Bach, Jim Forrester, uh, Don Foley, uh, because he did a lot of years of newsletter editing. And really so did Jim Forrester, but he also puts together our open house schedule. And if there's an open house or something, Jim is there, as well as doing the club uh, member uh, events that we've done there. And also Joey Pauling and a guy we just heard of from very recently, Awning. So uh, if I counted right, that gives us our nine uh, recipients. I will hopefully see that those are in my briefcase from now on and we're able to meet live. I will start distributing those, uh, you know, as I can. The complication too is that there is actually a year marked on the pin, but we can't totally line up the years with how we decided who should get the pins. 
uh, it just didn't really work out. So what I might do is just kind of throw them in a bag, so to speak. And when I hand them somebody, they can just reach in and we'll see what they get. They're all nice. It's just that maybe we could have thought, well, you're getting one mostly for astronomy at the beach, but maybe you got one that says 2000, uh, what would that be? You know, the year before COVID. So at any rate, yes, thank you. I couldn't figure that out for a second. Uh, and actually that was the only things I wanted to cover as far as the meeting. I don't think I have anything else. So I will move on then to other officers, starting with Joy. And thank you for doing the minutes, Joy. You're welcome. Um, updating the schedules, just waiting to hear when we're actually going to do something live somewhere. And I'll change it to say that. Thank you very much. And how about Liz? Well, I just want to emphasize that uh, the construction area up by the observatory renovation is, is pretty breathtaking. Um, for those of us old timers who are used to med sci one and two up there at the corner of Xena Pitcher, and I believe it's Anne sort of on your way to the dead end um, at the medical library that heads down the hill toward Angelo's. It's a crater at this point, okay? Um, they do still have that section of Anne closed down completely between Xena Pitcher and the roundabout at observatory, which is where the cardiovascular center is. Um, construction continues on the observatory renovation itself. It's going to have, I believe, its main entrance on observatory. And then it looks like there is a, a walkway up to the observatory building itself. So there's going to be a modern building there. Very nice looking. And then it doesn't look to me from the outside that there's a way to get into the observatory building except from going up uh, uh, a little pathway. I, I must not be seeing what they really intend there. So I'm, I'm just believing my eyes. The parking situation, that construction on the new hospital building, of course, is going to be a couple of years. So you can well imagine that there are going to be problems uh, for at least two years as, you know, construction teams come in and out. Um, the closest Mass parking, I think we all know who are familiar with that part of campus, is going to be at public health. Um, now, the Hill dorms are their own, you know, luau on Friday nights. Um, even in the 1950s, when my mother was at Moser Jordan, it was kind of a, you know, a party place up there. So, but the idea of having low ground meetings up at our dedicated observatory building on campus and a historic building going back into the mid you know 19th century especially since the university celebrated a bicentennial not too long ago i i think that is a tremendous opportunity again the logistics of parking have me a, a little concerned and it's kind of a commute to pizza house and i know this is all a priority for us right? um but i look forward to seeing how that's actually going to turn out and uh, i uh I have uh, the construction uh, photos, the artist's rendition of what it is, if you would, uh, I want to uh, see that from a shared screen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Good idea. You guys see that? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got the, uh, the old observatory here and then uh, the modern building there. Now what it yeah. doesn't show is the high rise that's going up across the street uh, this way. Right. But gives you an idea anyway. There we go. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much what they're building up there. So um, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Yeah, the Thank only you, parking I know of up there is that blue lot behind the School of Public Health across from Mary Markley. Um, you know, kind of you had Ronald McDonald House, it was just on the street. That lot is open to the public after 5 p.m. 
and it's two blocks from the observatory. Uh, but I have no idea what it's like there on a Friday night. I've only gone up there to use it to go into the yard. Um, so that's the only parking I know of that's in any, you know, sane distance with, of that building or, or will be for the next couple of years anyway. Okay, Adrian. All right, well, the outreach I've been doing is almost hit a tiring level. So <laughs> let's see, I've joined the following clubs in addition to being a lowbrow. I'm a member of WAS, uh, Warren Astronomical Society. I'm a newly minted member of RASC, the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada, because I've made friends with David Levy, Kareem Jaffer, and a few of the uh, RASC members from Montreal, Canada. Um, I've been a part of the uh, Explore Scientific outreach that happens every Tuesday. A couple of other, the um, astrophotography group that Aoni, myself, are in, um, Doug Bach, are in, have uh, also been a part of that. Um, I haven't done much with the McMath Hubert Society, but um, there, I got membership there too. They haven't been as active as far as I know, but I'm a phone call to Jim Shedlowski away from, um, you know, finding out what else is going on and um, being a part of Black with uh, basically offloading any and all work that I do to Brian, John, and Jeff. And they've been absolutely, you know, the Black board has been absolutely fantastic with, you um, doing the best we can to decide if we're going to be on site or virtual again this year. And you may have gotten a survey, and this is something that should go into minutes. You should have a survey by now that um, is getting opinions from all club members and the public. What would you like to see on, in September? The complication we have is that we don't have enough information yet to really say definitely we're going to do, you know, we're going to have an on-site um, event because we haven't reached a point where the COVID numbers are where we would like to see them and vaccinations are not available for children under 12 and we want to ensure the safety of all that would come to an event such as this. So it's the same thing that other clubs we're not the only club that's grappling with this. You have to keep in mind that we are, we want kids to look through telescopes too. So until everyone can be vaccinated, there is still a bit of a risk factor and we just have to keep that in mind. Obviously, you know, the nation and the world is really gravitating towards trying to open things all the way back up. So we're, you know, we're looking at what happens after July, you know, we'll, I think we'll have a little more of an indication of what's going on. So the, uh, um, the GLAC survey is in yeah, the chat. So just a whole lot of outreach. I'm going to be doing the MMSS tomorrow. Um, weather should be fine for that. I'll be presenting, and I'm actually going to try and fire up my telescope for that and show the MMSS folks the uh, night sky. I did a test run. Um, last night with Shannon Murphy and the connection to the computer I wanted to use looked like it worked really well. So um, so we'll try it again tomorrow night. Um, I'm going on late from 10 to 12. So should be should be a good time if all works out well. And my backup plan is just to show some images. Um, lots of imaging. I did catch the solar eclipse from the thumb. And um, I do have, I have images. I decided to, I've shown these images in some of the other meetings that I've been in. And I don't know that I sent any images to the lowbrow uh, camp this time. So um, I would be more than happy to share just one image that I took that I think um, would be worth sharing. And then that would end my report. If I can find the image pretty quickly, I will 
be happy to share it and I would think it should be that one. So let me quickly share my screen. And that is one of the images that I took. Um, Aoni talked about how when you have enough cloud cover, you can fire right at the sun. So this was a handheld portrait shot um, taken of the sun as it's peeking through the clouds, eclipsed off of a Point Bark lighthouse. Um, it bugs were everywhere. This happens to be a shot that didn't have many bugs in it. There's a bird right here. It was a beautiful morning. Um, the lighting was a little lower um, and you, know, you could you could kind of tell that it wasn't as bright even with the clouds around um, as soon as the sun escaped the eclipse it it began blaring so that was that's kind of how you knew you know the difference between your eclipse sun and once the moon once the eclipse was finally over so hopefully every hopefully most of you got a chance to see that um, every Tuesday night I'm involved with um, doing the Explore Scientific uh, live shows. And most of the time I share whatever images <laughs> I've got. And what that means is I now have access to even more speakers to talk to um, the names, you know, some of the names escape me. I think David Eicher is someone who I've connected with. There's uh, Stella Kafka from the AAVSO. You know, all there, there are some professionals that are now within range of bringing along as speaker. So there's some possibilities there. I can talk to a few of them on behalf of the Lowbrow Club um, if they may be interested in doing some speak, if they may be interested in speaking at one of our meetings. So I'll continue to work on that, um, continue spreading the outreach um, portion. Um, in the WAS group, they have an outreach chair and I like the idea so much that I might kind of do some of that within my VP position, just kind of work on outreach with all the connections that have just come flooding in lately and um, see if I can turn some of those into some speakers or opportunities for lowbrows. So, so with that, that is it for my report. Um, any questions you have, feel free to ask, but, um, yeah, it's been, I'm probably busier than I should be now. Um, and it's a lot of fun, but it can be draining because I'm on a Zoom call maybe three out of five days a week with some club. So, you know, not to mention, Jim, the the uh, photography group um, that Jenna is a part of, which thankfully now won't meet until September. So I, I catch a break. So, uh so yeah, just been real busy. Regarding that image, Adrian, I mean, think about it. Big water, insects, clouds. You should put a caption under it that says "Pure Michigan." <laughs> I, you know what? I had a Pure Michigan on Instagram, a Pure Michigan page, contact me with one of the images, and um, said, really? "Yeah, we'd like to use them," but I haven't heard much from them since. But uh, yeah, I do hashtag some of those shots, Pure Michigan. So that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> at some point this evening, hopefully we'll discuss um, the feasibility of the lowbrows uh, doing, you know, public observing events. Um, I don't think it's feasible, but um, I'm one member of out of 160. Um, member only events out of Peach Mountain, I think those are feasible. I think those we can control and make make safe, but when it's the random public um, and any number of people have made it clear that they will lie about their vaccination status to do whatever they want, um, there's, I just don't see it possible to trust the uh, the public when we know we're going to have kids out there and right so no jim your voice is heard and i i echo that basically on behalf of this board that is a concern i you know we mentioned children aren't vaccinated yet um 
and the general public, we get the messages talking about, come on, it's time to have a, uh, you know, it's time to have an open house. You're getting that in all the groups. Um, there's a random person that wants us to start meeting in person. And you know, we can't just randomly go out there. We know that the southern states, they, they're, they're working by different rules. So for like those of us that are going to go to Okie Tech in October, you know, that we've booked our trip, we still, we're vaccinated, I think most of us, and we plan to be as safe as we can. The Texas groups and like the Southern star parties operate by different rules. They've already opened everything up. We haven't as of yet, and we have to be more cautious, especially in our state. I think it's irresponsible to, you know, look at other states and say, well, they're doing it. If you look north to Canada, things are still locked down. They're just now opening up to allow visitation for vaccinated uh, people in Canada. They're more locked down, and a lot of other countries stayed locked down as a response to the uh, variant going around. So it, there's different responses, and COVID-19 hasn't gone anywhere despite the numbers going down and the vaccination rates going up. And, you know, there's still a lot of vaccine hesitancy. So, Jim, your your voice will be heard as far as figuring, determining when we should, you know, go ahead and open up. Member only things. In-house. Yeah. In-house, um, in-house uh, member only star parties. Um, I can put this out to, you know, people here. Who do we talk to to go ahead and get that moving? Is it is it um, talking to Cecilia? Is it working through Krishna to say we're ready to do this? We need to talk to um, College of Engineering. I, I would think it would be the College of Engineering since they. I was asking them before the meeting started, but that I would think that they would be the persons uh, them or C's because they control. The, the building I don't know, ownership, uh, responsibility, stewardship, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, Do we want to wait till the governor opens everything up in a week or two? I, I, I don't think I would uh, send anything uh, before July 1st because uh, uh, July 1st, the university is going to be opening up a number of things. Um, okay. I had the email uh, just a second ago. Uh, but basically, on July 1st, they're opening up the campus to most everything except things like classrooms or patient clinics. Um, yeah. uh, there was something else, but generally, where people are in closed spaces. Real tight, close quarters. Right. But then again, yeah. So. And I, I will say that uh, the university as a whole, the buildings are going to be opening in September, barring any other circumstances. Uh, it's being given to individual units, which in university speak is uh, large colleges, uh, research groups, etc. So, you know, they're going down at, a, at the next level down to start making these decisions about whether, you know, how they're going to implement COVID policy. But from a university level, things will start uh, opening up on July 1st. So I yeah, would think so a good time is, you know, anytime after July 1st, we July, could probably we start, start making doing, inquiries. But- yeah, it so my, nice well, go ahead, Jim, go ahead. On, it, um, it, on July 1st, because um, the dark of the moon is kind of like from the third or the fourth, uh, for the, you know, for the next eight or nine days. So um, it'd be terrific to get back up there um, during that period if we possibly can. Otherwise, it would be August before I think members. It would be worth doing. Yeah, Yeah, I would. I would say let's focus on member meeting as doing a star party as a member group. Let's work on keeping in house, and then pending the success of that, our next step would be to start talking about bringing the general public in, and if you know if we see ways of doing that, but maybe not worry about the general public until we've had our own member only star party and just kind of take it in steps that that may we basically become our own model for 
how we might be able to safely reintroduce night sky viewing with stuff. So, yeah, after July 1st, um, you know, maybe we uh, we talk to Krishna, Jeff, you know, maybe we, the community, our, our team works to get something out to the College of Engineering and just proposes that we're ready to have a, you know, now that things are opened up, we're ready to do a member night at Peach Mountain and see what they say. And if you, you know, if you want me to be a part of that, um, I'd be happy to help write an email or do, yeah. you know, whatever we need to do. So I just well, send, you do have all that yeah. spare time, Adrian. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's pulling it from wherever I can. Something else just gets canceled. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that, all of that basically ends my report. Thank you. I just put in the Amy. chat, um, the, uh, uh, text from President Schlissel's message, uh, for, that was pertinent to our situation. So if people want to read that over. Hey, thank you. Amy? Uh, nothing. Well, that was fast. <laughs> Beautiful uh, first uh, newsletter, by the way. I, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, we should all give Amy a round of applause for that newsletter. Yes. Very nice. Actually, she's got two of them out there now, so both excellent. Yeah, and your Milky Way shootings become better than my, coming better than mine, so stop it. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about Jeff? Uh, tonight we had uh, 28 max on Zoom and 6 on uh, YouTube for a total of 34 uh, present. Um, the only other development that's happened is like the communications committee, I, we were going to send out feelers to the U and I did find out that A, the U of M web services that we're having are going to be uh, continuing on indefinitely so we won't lose anything if they decide to you know change some stuff which doesn't sound like it's going to happen but there's also support for a couple of the content management systems that we were talking about anyway in the communications meeting so uh, I have I found out that the guy that's running it is one of my former co-workers so this will make life a little easier when we move stuff around uh, but they do have an alternate service that might allow us to try things and kick out and kick the tires a bit, all for free. So I think there's some nice options in the in the works there. But uh, the details are all techie crap right uh, at this point. So I'm not going to worry about that stuff. And I think that's all I got. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Jack. Okay, I'm going to go to share screen. And let's see, this should come up. Okay, can you see the uh, Yes, we can. Telescope, all right. Come on, where's the rest? That is the cave 8 inch, isn't it? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I was trying to get up. Okay, now to start off, this is the cave 8 inch F7. And we did have a group of me, myself, Don Floy, and uh, David Jorgensen. We did go out and uh, fix the uh, Telrad. We put a new a, uh, battery holder in there. The old one was corroded and busted out. Uh, now, we also did go in and put the new focuser in that we got, uh, that uh, Don Floy had bought. And we slipped that in there and got everything set up in the scope. So this is as they say good to go and we'll be working on you know we have our open houses and that uh, if people would still want to use it that's fine uh don did check out the bluetooth and the tracking on it that's seen that still works so it's a nice little scope you could take out there and do something so that was taken care of and we're going to move on to the next one uh, some of you are familiar with this some of you aren't this is the Argo Navis on the side of the um, McMath mounting. And this has been a problem. This RTC battery flat means you lose your date and time. So when you go to set this up, 
and set your tracking and you lose your date and time and everything, uh, <laughs> screwed. So uh, we've been working on this. We actually went in and uh, tore this out of the building, took it over to Don's house. As you can see, we uh, took the back of the piece off here, but in order to really check why this isn't making contact and what's going wrong, and we pulled it out, got it down to the uh, circuit board, and we were able to go in and bend these uh, holders back, make them more stiffer, and we also noticed on the bottom here that there was no damage to the circuit board or anything. So we put everything back in place, and I brought it back out to the observatory, got it up and running here. Some of you are familiar with the setting and understanding the layout. So turned on the uh, Argo Navis, SkyFi, set everything up to work because we haven't used this in over a year. I mean, I've, I've went out and turned it on just to make sure it works for it. When we had these couple failures, that's when we decided to uh, took a more important look at it. So we got this set up. Now, this is important. I know some of you will understand this. I'm going to explain this. When you have the Argo Navis, the Wi-Fi, and everything turned on, and you have it hooked up to your cell phone or iPad, and I happen to have an iPad on this one, this is the center crosshair you get on your Sky Safari. And when you have everything connected properly, and if for those of you that, are, that, that know how to run this, if you look down here where it says disconnect, that means it's connected. And the next thing I did was unlock the declination setting. And I took the declination setting and I moved the telescope and declination to go up. So if you look at this line here, this is my original line down here. And we're still connected. As I move the telescope up, the crosshair track with the movement. So at least I know things are functioning and we we should be able to get back on track and using it, but you really won't know that until we go out and actually line up the scope and set it up on a couple of stars and go through a regular line uh, alignment, then do some star hopping, object hopping, some galaxies, clusters, to see how well the telescope is working in that. So we've got that part taken care of and we're gonna work on that. Now, this is some discussion we had on the uh, <clears throat> observatory. Now, we've got the radio, tele radio observatory building out there. When you go up to the radio telescope building, there's a small building on the left. This is the small building on the left. Now, some of you might recognize this little uh, cylinder or top here. This is Starlink, and the Starlink originally was in this circular top, but it got too hot, so they moved it out, and this is the Starlink now in opening. So, right now, the radio observatory up there is using Starlink. Now, they're not hooking up to a cable system, or they're hooking up to this AT&T tower system. I still haven't gotten word on the AT&T tower. And I talked to Professor Cutler. He was out there and he said what they've done. So they're going with the Starlink. They bought in, they've got the system there. They've got a little bandwidth projector that projects uh, part of this over to the radio observatory. So this is all one piece here with the Starlink on top. They've got a couple of security cameras on the sides of that. And here is the back of the building. And the reason they're tearing everything out of the back of the building is they have a group in there, construction company going in, ripping out all the molded uh, chalkboard and everything. And they're cleaning it out completely. They have a water system and pump in the back. Some of you saw this when we were up there last year, we did a tour, um, they took some pictures. That's all being cleaned out. And uh, the windows are being repaired and everything. He's got a couple more security cameras on the outside. 
and they're going to refix the fence and everything. They're doing a lot of work up there. And as you can see, this is the radio observatory in the other building in the back. All this trees and shrubs are all been cleared. You can see down the side, this area has been cleared out. You can see down through here and back and on the other side. And this has to do with the security cameras they're putting in. And they've got a group in there that will be out next week uh, fixing up the fences and restructuring probably with concertina wire like they used to do that. It's all part of the security procedures. Went up there and I talked to Professor Cutler again about this. And he says, the universe is in line with doing this. We're getting, we're getting it taken care of. Now, here's the big question. While I was up there, I talked to him about this whole thing with COVID-19. And I asked him what he was doing up here, what was going to happen with the opening, reopening, and things of this nature. Starting in September, for right now, he is planning on having a spacecraft design class in the radio observatory building, which means he's doing this to facilitate this as an educational facility. That's why I brought in the Starlink to use with the facility to show what types of equipment they need to continue and do this. Now, my question to him was, okay, if you're going to run a class up here in September, uh, what's the possibility of us University of Lowbrows reopening to the math, math observatory and having public open houses. I discussed this with him and he said, based on U of M guidelines, what happens after July 1st and the fact that he will be conducting classes out there, he thought it should be feasible we could have public open houses in September. Now, he's not the person that guarantees this. U of M first guarantees it and then sets up the guidelines. But the fact they're allowing him to have a class out there, which means they're going to have to have some type of a student transportation out there for the students and stuff like that. And they've got to look at that whole area differently and uh, look at it more, uh, opening it up more to uh, university guidelines. Therefore, in September, yeah. A good possibility we could be holding open houses there. So that is what has been going on out at Radio Observatory. They're doing a lot of this grounds and maintenance work because they do want to get the security system up and hold the classes out there, which means once they start holding classes out there, uh, some of you probably understand this. This now redirects funding and uh, reusing this radio observatory now more for educational purposes and academic purposes, which means uh, the next question is we want to get back into some type of academic research. Now, I know some of you are familiar with the radio telescope here. I know some of you understand the tracking. There is a, a organization in the area that Professor Cutler has talked with, and uh, they uh, looked at a price and a cost for restructuring this mechanical composition here to where they could track satellites with it, regular satellites, CubeSats, and stuff like that. So now that would be a very useful and functioning piece of equipment, along with an academic program out there. So. A lot of this is, uh, I, I can't guarantee that that's all going to happen, but I think the academic part is. And this is what he's trying to do. So he's setting this up based on uh, U of M guidelines, academic policy, things like that. And follow, following that to get this back as a functioning radio observatory. That's about it I've got, any questions? It's great that they're doing stuff out there and they're actually putting some effort and, and dollars into those facilities. It's been, yeah. what, eight, nine years now? 
Yeah, and the other argument is all the vandalism that's going on there once they start getting academic classes up there and groups going up there all the time. Uh, well, the vandals the, will probably disappear, hopefully. And, well, and if uh, not, they're going to get caught on camera now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, they, oh, by the way, just so we do know, uh, he does have cameras here on the side of the buildings. There is a outdoor lighting here, so he can run those cameras at night if anybody wants to walk up there, try and break in, hump the fence and that. But we did discuss it, and if we, when we have public open houses here on the area and observing, uh, we can shut that light off. I'm not sure how bright that light is, because I know it shines downward, so you can see people on the fences and the grounds coming into it. It's not something that shines up in the sky, but uh, he did mention we could turn that off during an observing session there. Yeah, so, it, it is, it is really, uh, really key that there's classes going on because that's an educational mission of the university and the funding channels are much different than if he's strictly a researcher. So he, yeah. he, may, he may have done that on purpose too, simply to get some funding for the projects uh, from that educational tap. But it means that it's more mainstream than just the researchy stuff, which is great that, news for us. So that my question, yeah, my question, Jack, is the Starlink <clears throat> that's there in you know, access, would we be, is, has it been asked if we would be given access to that um you know some for anything that we may want to do in the mcmath or broadcast from the mcmath okay the starlink has about uh, 30 megs download another 10 or 20 upload it does not have that uh, high bandwidth and resolution that we talked about now I really don't know, I, well, I should, well, from, okay. From my personal working on this bandwidth with other organizations and stuff, us trying to hook up and use that, I don't think the bandwidth is there, to be honest with you, when you think about it. Because we were, yeah. they were looking at bringing in a one gigabyte fiber line into that area. That's not gonna happen. Okay. That AT&T tower might have been a good thing. Uh, the other thing is because of where the observatory is located downhill, um, the signaling and reception isn't as good as the uh, uh, Starlink here sitting on the higher ground up away from the observatory. So uh, I know from personal use when I tried to uh, use it uh, through my car with the uh, add-on from AT&T, I had too many bandwidth problems. You know, I, yeah, things would I come remember. in good, then all of a sudden, poof, things would disappear. Yep. I'd get fracturing and splintering of the screens and everything else. So, Yep, I remember that. Now, it's ironic. That's the Starlink system. That's being... That's what the satellite trains yeah. are about that we complain about seeing through yeah. the uh, night sky. That is the very unit that we're, you know, we're sort of vehemently opposed. There are still discussions in the astronomy communities about sure. what can be done about the actual satellites that are providing the Internet that that Starlink system is using. So kind of ironic that there will be a there will be a starlink system <laughs> yeah. out there and we're going to be back to observing out there in the near future now starlink <clears throat> 499 dollars for the receiver 99 dollars a month now let's say you were to go out and buy a unit and you lived out in that area and after you had it four or five months you just didn't get good reception with it didn't like it okay you cancel your subscription you don't pay 99 a month but you're stuck with that 499 dollars receipt you don't give it back you don't get your money back on it now the other thing going on out there that is something else i've been kind of paying attention to some of you may know this too by the way 
Washtenaw County Bro Broadband Committee has been meeting and working with the state and federal resources and money to enhance um, the a, uh, broadband connections or Wi-Fi connections, bring out the internet more openly to the rest of the Washtenaw County area. Like, yeah, it's good downtown certain cities, but the surrounding areas is not that good. So yeah, in the next couple of years, they may come up with a real good plan or the next year or two. As far as for us as a Wi-Fi for the observatory, from what people want to do uh, about uh, running Zoom meetings and doing the astrophotography at night kind of programs and stuff like that, I don't think it's going to work out that well there. And I think we ought to see how well the Starlink works for the university because I got a feeling that is going to be, um, how would I say, probably the minimal for them. Uh, it's not going to deliver the maximum that they want. I can tell you that right now. And 30 down, 30 download, and 10 or 20 upload megabytes is nothing. I, in my unit here in the house, I'm up in a couple hundreds up and a couple hundred down. But then again, I've got a hard line from Comcast coming into the house, so big difference. And I know other people have the same thing in their house. And I know some people, depending where you live at, uh, they can pay for that one gigabyte line to their house if they want. But, uh, so my opinion on Wi-Fi, to hold off on that for another year. I don't see us doing nothing. And then the other thing is working with Professor Cutler, looking at the spots he gets from his Wi-Fi, how well it works out there. If at a later date if they sell these, there's certain, I know some of you are familiar with it, they have certain types of Wi-Fi amplifiers that they're building now to increase up, uh, down and upload and everything. Uh, the mega fights you can get out of them. Uh, it sounds good. I know they hook up and run off your router and speed up everything. I don't know how well they work with a Starlink. So I think the best thing for us is I'm going to continue to pay attention, talk with Professor Cutler at times on how well this is working. Maybe there's something we could test on it with them later once they get it up and running for the classrooms and they see how well it works. We can get a better idea of how well that unit functions out there. Now, for us to get it to work because we're down off the hill and our, we may have to come up with some type of taller antenna that picks up the signal. I know we discussed that in the past, so. Um, I guess we'll take a wait and see attitude how well this works for Professor Cutler out there for his classes and stuff that's going to be doing out there. Any more questions? I'm good. Okay. Oh, Great. one Thank other you, one, Jeff. one thing I was going to ask Adrian Bradley. Adrian, are you a member of an RASC center or just an out, uh, out state member, as they call it? I, uh, I picked the Sarnia Center as my. Uh center okay i belong to the london center okay i belong to it for way back when i know uh, i i wasn't sure which one i thought of the blue water bridge and i said sarnia so that was the one that i went with the windsor one probably would have been closer to me but um the blue water bridge won out otherwise i would have just joined the london one with you but i figured okay. if you're if you're in the rask you know the center it almost doesn't matter which one um but i guess i'll find that out later on so okay yeah it was uh that's cool and we'll, we'll see what membership benefits i get and um try and pass some of that info along okay does anybody have anything else Um, are we going to attempt to write up anything or construct how we want to do member nights out at uh, 
on a peach mountain so that when we when it's the appropriate time to say something to whomever that we actually have something to say to whomever we could probably do that i i the only thing i've done is talk i remember with you and a few other people you know about the member nights only uh going back into vaccination issues like that uh, how do we verify that the person is vaccinated that says he is vaccinated that's a good they point about bring bringing their children card. well yeah that's that's part of it and i, I have the issue about children coming out there that aren't vaccinated being exposed that's not a thing we have to uh, bring up and discuss too they're good points they are very good yeah there's going to be a hard decision to make um, because we know the we know already that outdoors all of the masking requirements have been lifted and it's been so for like a month or so. But as the club, we can determine who we want at member only sites. We I think we have the right to have a bit better control over who can come out it would be a problem to tell members sorry you can't bring your kids unless they're 12 or older at this time it may be a sticking point but you know it may be something that we need to consider um so that's i don't i don't know if further discussion is going to help it just may be up to one of us to write up a proposal and you know maybe vote on it over email and then send it in um you know officer i don't know if another officer's meeting should be called simply to discuss it maybe try it over email first or you know discuss it some more at the next uh, member meeting so but yeah we bottom line we can make it as stringent or as not stringent as we want for a member only event um come september or come better numbers more regulation or vaccines for younger children that's when you talk about opening things up making it look more like a normal star party um being able to share the eyepieces again um talk about how to do that safely even so that that's it's a good question jim and it's it's something that you know one of us maybe just we'll just start with a proposal maybe the most stringent of proposals and then bring it down talk about what to do for members with younger children that would like them to come out and view the night sky maybe we can make a provision for them maybe we we use we use masking for the young children so there there are some uh options there well, like you say, we can make, when it's just us, we can make up whatever rules we think are appropriate. And right. if we say that you have to be vaccinated uh, if you're eligible, um, then you bring your little white card and everything's fine and children can come because they're not going to get COVID for anybody, from anyone that, uh, comes True. up there uh, on our, you know, that's within the club. Right. Who can be up there. It's yeah, and then the concern. Too. There's, you know, in this state, there's tens of thousands of people that are immunocompromised for one reason or another. Um, they still aren't going anywhere because it isn't safe for them. Yeah. Um, we also have to consider that at some point you have to face the idea that there are going to be some people that are just simply not going to get vaccinated they're just against it whatever age they might be and what are you going to do about that you know well, you, and that's where i think we just yeah. we put our foot down at this point because we've tried to consider vaccinated and unvaccinated alike and it keeps coming up with the possibility of transmission um so as because it's member only that gives us a little more power to say bring your vaccination card 
if you want to do this first first round of member only nights this is how we're going to break it back in as a club bring your card because in we're our hope is that in the coming months we're able to open up and we're you know we'd be looking to cdc and other expert guidance and then and it ultimately would come down to the u of m telling us you are able to allow any and everyone the threat of we've decided that the threat of uh or the risk of transmission has now reduced to the point where we're ready to open everything to the public and then we can open up more to the public as well um so as the lowbrow group we can determine who comes in it will cause a bit of hurt feelings if somebody in our membership isn't vaccinated but at this point we either take the stand or we hold off from doing membership only um events until everybody's comfortable having them and um you know it vaccination is a personal choice but if we were to take a poll from the club how many of us have gotten vaccinated and it's enough of the membership to say that's enough people let's go hold an open house then that's how you know, that's how we would move forward we we basically have to hit the, the issue head on and if there is a whole lot of blowback from it or you know we get members wanting to cancel membership because you know, you, you people are forcing vaccination and, you know, Bill Gates didn't get vaccinated and you start hearing all these conspiracy theories. But if it's enough of an issue, then we would have to address that. I don't think we're going to have that much of an issue with our club. Um, I was still hearing things like that out in the wild, but with our club, you know, and we're, we're a science club. So we follow what the science experts have told us and it says vaccination is a good thing. So we we shouldn't shy away from requiring that if that's what it'll take to do membership nights. So it my would opinion, be interesting to see what the numbers are within our club, because as I go to various places around Ann Arbor and, and actually ask people uh, what they have heard, what I'm hearing is that almost all of them are saying that they're hearing numbers that would put the Ann Arbor area, now not excluding kids because a lot of them couldn't do it yet, but outside of that group, I've been astounded. They are confidently telling me the numbers are over 90%. In fact, my dentist said she would bet, and they've been asking everybody that it's 98% of the people going to my dentist. So that perhaps is encouraging being that most of us are from the general area. In the last couple of weeks, I've had tradespeople into the to the house. Neither one of them has been vaccinated. Really, from this area too? From this area, an electrician and uh, an arborist. And, and so, there's plenty of unvaccinated people out there now. You know where the electrician actually lives? That's I have no idea. Right. The arborist is located in Novi or someplace like that. So it, you know, whenever you invite people, we get people from all over Southeast Michigan to, um, to our open houses, at least we have in the past. Uh, you know, people, you know, drive 40, 50 miles or more to, you know, the opportunity you know it's like a you know once a year or once every several years thing but we get a steady stream of those people and there's no way for us to know um uh, what they think about vaccinations and that's why i'm reluctant about open houses there's other reasons you know because of the variants going around but um but that's that's another discussion but the member nights i've i felt confident for a year that we could do it but i just you know now that people are vaccinated and i think it's highly likely that the great majority of the club 
members are vaccinated that you know we ought to be pushing on this is you know so that we can create safe observing opportunities for our members and their and their families yeah so we can so similar to the black survey that's going out just asking about you know i don't think um brian adams asking about vaccination in his particular survey yeah. but maybe we talk about asking about it in us and just send the simple question if we made our member only nights a vaccinated only event to ensure the safety of everyone would you attend there you and go. ask That's for an honest idea. answer yeah from the membership i can put I'll put it as a to-do, and it can go into minutes so that I don't forget, because um, I will put together that question, and it's we'll send it out to the idea. membership. Yeah. Let's do that, and let's see what we got. Yeah, we'll give us a measurement. I feel you can do anything you want as long as you word it that way, you know, and an open house for members only this Saturday that can produce vaccine cards. Or a, you know, open house for the general public coming up in September that can produce, produce vaccine cards for 12 and ups. As long as it is advertised exclusively that way, yeah. you can Carding, do it. It especially be that it's, that it's a medical type. You know, the property is a medical type facility. That's you're in partnership yeah. with a <laughs> a healthcare yeah. type place. And, and even even the governor in her you know the proclamation or whatever for next Tuesday is there's always an exception. It's like you know individual organizations may choose to have increased right. uh, levels, so uh, that qualifies us. Our problem is the university has got their own set of rules for what they want to do, so we yeah. have to. That's our that's our minimum yeah. standard there. Yeah, right. yeah. Is, but as far as the public goes. There's no way we can control people. Somebody drives an hour to come out to Peach Mountain and, and they haven't been vaccinated and they didn't pay any attention to the uh, calendar. They just, you know, know from 15 years ago, the last time they were out that uh, these are the nights that the, the open houses are. Um, and they show up and they, they're not vaccinated and they could care less if anybody else is or isn't and what and we're outside is. yeah there's there's all kinds of reasons why we are not equipped to uh deal with the public in that way um but a closed loop like the uh the membership that we can do or we could do it with the membership of you know other clubs if we want to invite other clubs up but you know, yeah, those are things work. we can manage, but we cannot manage the general public. Yeah, I would agree. And yeah, other clubs are grappling with it. Um, there are still virtual events going on. Um, and then don't talk about overseas because overseas events are going to be virtual for the very near future. They They are even more stringent about COVID than we are. So... They, it's, it really depends on where you are. We have, we have a lot of cavalier folks in our state that, you know, the vaccine hesitancy is wherever it is. There's still a lot of it going on. And, um, you know, if, a, if we're going to address the general public, we have to deal with that. And that's even if we, we mandate who we want at our club. I think the fallout, we do risk the fallout being a little more um, if we mandate that the general public bring your vaccination card. We would be within our rights. So it's not that we couldn't do it, but it opens up a bigger can of worms. Now, members only, I think that's a great place to start. And as I said before, if we focus on a members only event and have one, that gives us kind of a measuring stick to go forward. Like this worked out pretty well. We saw a lot more people than we thought we would that were willing to come out and bring their vaccination cards. 
let's move forward with that. You know, we, you know, we could talk about the results from that and, you know, so that it, if we take it a step at a time, starting with this, uh, kind of this one line email survey that we'll send out and we'll see what we get. And, um, and then after that, send us a note to, um, to the college of engineering and, you know, after July 1st, We'll see if we can make some headway on getting a member open house going. Um, one other question that just came up, uh, I just found out about the uh, state of California is going to roll out a digital vaccine verification. Just came over the news. And that's something that's been talked about different states, verifying people so they want some kind of vaccine verification. Some have said, no, we're not doing it. Some said, well, we might. California says they're doing it, so that may play into if there's a way. Then, all I guess we do is submit all the members, club members, email addresses, their names, and find out if they're vaccinated. Yeah, and that's if the state of Michigan does it. And I don't uh, know. California yeah. is. So we'll see how they're going to do it, and we'll see what happens yeah. with Michigan because they may follow or they may not. I don't know. Yeah, they've got a Democratic governor and. Uh, and super majorities in both houses of their legislature, so California can do it. Um, yeah. Because there's virtually no Republicans in power there. But the state of Michigan is different. The legislature will scream bloody murder uh, if uh, if Whitmer tries to yeah um, to do anything like that. Uh, yeah, Whitmer so it's was not pretty happened here. Whitmer was pretty much shut down and we had another spike. Um, Whitmer was pretty much shut down from I- imposing any sanctions at all. All she could do was tell, give suggestions and, you know, just say, look, you, you all are grown adults. The last time I tried to do something to save lives, a hit was put out for my life. So not sure I want to do that again. So. You know, if businesses did take up the cause and I think more businesses started to require the masking. You began to see more masking yeah. after our spike and then we st- then the vaccination started to go up and the cases started to fall again. Yeah, but, well, uh, in the big hospital systems in Michigan, at least the ones I know about, um, you know, you're vaccinated or you're gone. And you yeah, know, if you're an employee. Uh, yeah, doctors have started. My doctor said that they now require you to be vaccinated to work for them. There's still some legacy that refuse to get vaccinated that are in the hospital system. Um, not much they can do about those, but they've made it a requirement for new hires to be vaccinated. I think the fear of invoking people's ire for forcing vaccination to do whatever activity or be a part of whatever organization. I think that fear of pissing people off is starting to go away. And they're just saying, look, get vaccinated or you can't be a part of our group. I don't know that we can go so far as to say you can't be a member of the lowbrows, but at this present time, because of the where we are, the pandemic not being over although it is you know it's reclining but it's not over if you want to come out to members only open houses with us we are requiring vaccinations at this time that may be enough for us to tell the membership we can send out the survey of course and then you know then we can go further but requiring vaccinations is becoming more and more of a thing that that's my my uh observation well, you know, you're going to send out, Adrian, you're going to send out uh, you know, our little one question questionnaire. Yeah, and, make and it this, real simple. And, That's, uh, it's probably going out before the uh, <laughs> meeting ends, but keep, so, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> but I, anyways, I think, you know, I'm certainly happy with the discussion we've had tonight. I don't know whether there's more people want to say about that. Well, it is approaching 10 o'clock. I think we've worked this over pretty well. So unless we have anything else, 
I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Support. Third. Okay. Fourth. Anybody opposed? Very well. Good night all. No, it's a rebound. Yeah, good night. Take care. Thank you, everybody. See you at the pizza house in a few months. Good meeting.